Good morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to today's Wednesday seminar. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we meet today and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are participating in our seminar today. Welcome. Our talk this morning is planning for impact mapping and quantifying the benefits of public sector geoscience. And we have a team of presenters for you today. Keith Serkin, who was the program coordinator for the first phase of Exploring for the Future. John Soderborn is the director of the science and technology practice for Aisle Allen Consulting. Ron Hackney is a senior geoscientist in the Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division. Joe Maloney is a senior commodity specialist in the same division. And Rani Austin is an evaluation and engagement specialist in the place, space and communities division at Geoscience Australia. Further information on each of our amazing speakers is available on the seminar registration page. And there's a, chink, a link for that in the chat. Please join with me virtually welcoming all of our today's speakers. Thank you, Marina, and thank you everyone for, um, for joining us today. Um, we'll uh, get into the presentation. As I said, there's, uh, we've got several speakers. It's a, a wonderful topic to be talking about, and we've got some you know, people who are very interested in uh, interesting things to say about this. So um, we look forward to feedback as well. So I'd like to start today um, today's talk by uh, bringing up a couple of statements which I thought are very pertinent to this presentation. So um, one of them is around the, uh, the basically the Geoscience Australia Strategy 2028, where we support evidence-based decisions through information, advice and services for a strong economy, resilient society and sustainable environment. And this is sort of the core of GA's mission. Um, this is our why. Um, this is what we're aiming for as an organisation. And you, know, you could read that as simply to say, we're here to use science to make Australia a better place. And if you've been tuning into these seminars over the last few months, you will know that we do amazing science at Geoscience Australia that builds an incredible picture of the earth, of, of a dynamic crust and atmosphere and oceans that have evolved over four and a half billion years. The second statement is a reminder that um, the science is, the amazing science is, is um, a big part of the job, but it's not the whole job. And uh, I read this statement from Sir Mark Walport, who was then the, uh, the chief scientific advisor in the UK, as a reminder that uh, it's not just about communicating the science, the amazing science, it's also about telling people about how that science is impacting them, what effect it has on their day-to-day -day life. And that is largely what we'd be talking about today is about how we go about explaining and demonstrating the impact that that science has. And the reason we do this is because science is as awesome as it is, and you can you know, pitch yourself in there if you're a scientist about what you do, be it at a microscope or increasingly you know, in front of a computer at home these days. Um, but it's part of a, obviously a bigger, bigger picture across all of society and all of these different value um, bubbles, streams, whatever you'd like to call them around commerce and industry, the economy, the environment, and health and politics. And science has to be set um, in that. And we have to think about uh, recognizing how science works within that more bigger picture and how we interact. And the point here is, is that science is not independent of that society. In order to maximize the impact of our research, uh, we have to understand how all of that works, how all of those systems work together. And there's several, there's sort of several points that we'll, we'll raise through today as well. It's important to recognise that the value isn't just in dollar terms here. Um, you, you'll recognise that many of these these areas and and others that aren't necessarily on this simple graph have different benchmarks for judging value. And it's also important to emphasise that, that that somehow this doesn't make science the lesser if it's part of a bigger picture. Uh, the science still has to be of excellent value um, in and of itself in order to have impact in the, these areas. It has to be of high quality, it has to be reliable, and it has to be trustworthy. And a lot of what you'll hear today is about how we go about building that trust, about demonstrating that we're worthy to use those resources, about how we need to be accountable for those resources that we've been, we've been given within that bigger picture, 
how we as good scientists analyze the impact of what we're doing to make it better because that's you know following good science principles that we test and try and experiment and you know understand and try better next time and then also advocacy about how we make our case to get those those resources in order to do this work in order to help the benefits of the whole so with that i'll hand over to john to sort of um give you oh sorry before i do that i'll, I'll sort of go through the um outline of what we're talking about today so i'll, I'll hand over shortly to john who will talk a bit more about the um the actual the details of the impact uh, pathway itself and some of the observations that he's made from applications as processed elsewhere uh, Ron will outline some of the case studies that have been developed following the impact evaluation process that uh, we worked through in the first phase of the Exploring for the Future program and also previous Geoscience Australia work. Uh, Joe will talk about some exciting new work where we're employing at Geoscience Australia where we're using economic modelling tools to look forward to forecast the potential impact of programs like the Exploring for the Future. And Rani will outline an example of how the impact pathway approach has been woven into future work planning to ensure that we're well set up to capture and demonstrate impact. So I'll hand over to uh, John now. You'll have to bear with us as we work through all of this because we've, uh, we're, we're learning how to uh, use multiple setups. So I'll hand over to John now. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, I'm hoping that you can all see my screen now. Um, the um, the importance of evaluation. You know, why do we why do we do evaluation? Well, uh, as you as you know, public funding for research is is always a challenging uh, uh, task. To, to obtain more money is is increasingly difficult, uh, and it's probably likely to get more difficult. And as you know, as, as Keith mentioned, you know, science not only has to be done, it has to be communicated. Um, and that includes communicate part of that communication is communicating what the benefits of research uh, uh, is or are. Um, so the, the important is that impact evaluations can give you that that evidence that you need of the um, economic, the environmental, the societal um, uh, benefits that have been delivered by a particular science program, such as uh, GA's pre-competitive research. And they can, do, they can actually provide um, um, good, strong arguments as to why funding should be continued or increased. Uh, you know, ACE Allen has done a lot of these impact assessments for different research or public publicly funded research organizations uh, and they've been we've been lucky enough to be quite successful in in telling the stories of that research because it is about telling a story about the research there is the economics side of it but it's also telling the story the building the narrative around a particular research project so those uh, case studies, those assessments that we've done have, have helped CSIRO, um, the Australian Animal Health Laboratory, and of course, GA to, uh, to get additional funding uh, for their various projects. Um, not saying it's the only thing, um, but it, it doesn't do any harm. So but impact evaluations can also be useful from the perspective of, of helping you understand how your work is, how your research is, is um, being used and designed. Uh, it tells you uh, what is working and what isn't. It, it shows accountability for, for public resources and that's important. So how do you evaluate the impact of a project? You've seen this uh, picture of uh, impact pathway before. We talk about uh, the flow from inputs through to activities, then outputs, outcomes and impact, impacts. So in the case of uh, GA, I mean, inputs, for example, uh, are things like data, um, funding, in-kind support, uh, infrastructure, 
that might be used and IP, existing IP and so on. Use those inputs to deliver activities and that, that might be things like surveys, doing analysis, literature reviews to assess uh, what the science is saying, research, modeling and so on and so forth. Um, those activities generate outputs, things like models, publications, maps, data sets that are then made available to the public. Um, they then uh, generate outcomes. And that's really what, what, the, what the project is, is, uh, has achieved or is supposed to achieve. And that may be, in the case of GA, is things like increased exploration, more interest in exploring for a particular mineral in a particular area, and so on and so forth. Um, and what and the impact is then is what is that? What do those outcomes generate? And that that is things like a new mine, um, and related to that, obviously employment, uh, exports, and so on. We also have to think about uh, what the implications are for the environment or society. And for example, some of the work that the Exploring for the Future program was doing was looking for water resources, which are important for environmental reasons and societal uh, benefits too, as, as are some of the mining developments that that program encouraged. So what have I, I've done a lot of a lot of um, case studies, we call them case studies, but individual projects. Um, and what are we, what about sort of some of the things I've found, I guess. Um, they all use the same impact pathway, uh, as I showed on the previous slide, but they do tend to differ in how that pathway is is used in some way, but we have to look at how, what the impacts are and what the, how you determine value can vary quite considerably from, from, from research project to research project. In the case of GA, uh, we used actual or an assumed mine development to estimate what the benefits were. For the CSIRO climate adaptation flagship, we showed, you know, that we looked at the voided costs uh, and did research that to, to establish uh, to establish that adaptation planning could help reduce the cost of that adaptation by as much as 50%. In the, for the Australian Animal Health Laboratory, now the Australian Centre for D Disease Prevention, um, we, we estimated uh, the impacts of of uh, the research they were doing in terms of the insurance value that they held. In other words, how much would you be prepared to pay to reduce the cost of a particular disease outbreak? Uh, we've also done work for groups like the CRC for Spatial Info Information, where we looked at the, at the effects of those services on the productivity of, of downstream users and how that help them to value add. Uh, and of course, we also looked at social and environmental benefits. Medical research organizations, um, there we look, we talk about the value of life and the quant quality of life metrics uh, that are well established uh, and accepted. I guess one of the, um, our case studies always include a CBA, a cost benefit analysis. But they also have a narrative, and that's probably just as important as the as the sort of dry economic numbers, because it's the narrative that takes the reader of the case study along on the journey, if you like, to understanding what the research was about and how how it was delivered and what benefits flow from it. So, it's important. The other another thing that's very important is to be pretty conservative. We always uh, are, are very conservative in our approaches. That means we tend to lowball potential benefits um, because we find that it's, we argue that it's much better to 
underestimate potential benefits than to overestimate it because there's a risk if the reader of a case study thinks, well, that's um, very, very over optimistic or seems extremely uh, um, blue sky thinking or something like that, then it it really devalues the value of that case study because if they don't believe the, 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 the narrative and the story, then they're not going to believe the uh, cost benefit analysis. So our, our aim is always to establish a very plausible, a very defensible lower bound for the benefits of a particular research project. Um, that's, that's, uh, that, and we don't mind. We're happy to, to, to over deliver, if you like. And usually when we've gone back and, and looked at case studies in the past, re, revisited case studies, past case studies, we found that um, in the main, we're pretty spot on in terms of the benefits to be delivered. We ask, we are, we do tend to be, if anything, somewhat low, low in our estimates. But the reassuring thing is that we've always been able to show that the the benefits have actually, if they're not occurred in a particular area that where we have assumed some benefit, they've occurred in a different area and the benefits are largely the same as what were expected. The other thing that we found is that evaluation is always much, much easier to do if the projects uh, evaluation ready when we come along. So how do you how do you make sure that a project is evaluation ready? Well, it's important to think about that impact pathway during the planning and approval stages of the project. That doesn't mean you you're, you're going as far as obviously doing an evaluation, but thinking about it, um, in other words, what, what is success going to look like? How am I going to measure success? What are the sort of performance indicators that I can use to, to, to measure what the outcomes and impacts have been of a particular project? The other thing is to, to engage with your stakeholders early in the piece, to really understand what, what the inputs are into the project, to talk about things like attribution and where the data might come from to help you assess what a counterfactual is. A counterfactual, a counterfactual is what would have happened if you hadn't done this research. And it's very often very difficult to go back after the event and actually assess or determine what the counterfactual is if you haven't thought about it before you start the project. And as part of that process, you need to develop a, a data collection plan that, that tells you what sort of data you're going to collect, how you're going to collect it, who's responsible for collecting it. I think that's giving you a bit of an overview from, from my perspective of someone who does a lot of, of case studies. And I'll throw back to Keith, is it, to uh, introduce the next speaker. Uh, it's, it's Ron here. I'm going to jump in now. Okay, look, um, I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes or so just speaking about some of the examples that John and his team uh, did the uh, economic sort of analysis for using that impact pathway. Um, so this will be dominated quite a bit by the economic side of it, but of course we've heard there's the social side of it and the environmental side. Um, we'll hear a bit more about the social side from Joe next up and I'll, I'll end on that sort of point for him to carry over. So really what uh, ASIL Allen has done for us is uh, use this impact pathway to assess a range of case studies from our Exploring for the Future program and beforehand. And I'll quickly just go through some of the narrative for each of those case studies and then present some, some of the numbers that come out of those, uh, those, those studies. Uh, hang on, sorry, get mouse in the right window. Okay, so the first case study, the first three case studies were all from the first phase of this Exploring for the Future program. Uh, it was the 100 million program which ran from 2016 to 2020. Um, and the first one I'm going to mention is this sort of project that came up uh, in, in, uh, in EFTF about mapping the plate thickness around the world, which came up with the surprising discovery that 85% of the world's sediment hosted base metal deposits lie within 200 kilometres of the edge of plates. 
And you can see in this map here, the blue areas are where the plates thicker essentially, and you can see those purple symbols, and they generally tend to be around the edge of that uh, of, of, of the plates. Um, when we do that, we can come up with some kind of prospectivity map, which gives us an indication of the likelihood of finding deposits in that space based on the sort of the correlation that we've seen around the world of, uh, of those base metal deposits and, and where they lie relative to those edges. So we can then make some assumptions in that whole modelling process. What if we do find a particular type of mine? What's going to be the economic benefits of that? And I'll come to that shortly when I've run through the other case studies. The second one we were looking at was the, uh, the East Tenant region in the Northern Territory. Um, and in that case, in EFTF, we collected a whole range of data, geophysical data, geochemical data, um, just about everything, um, and really identified a new mineral exploration fairway in this region. The map you're looking at at the bottom there is a, a mineral potential map as well, with the you know, redder, orangey colours meaning higher mineral potential, and that dashed uh, oval there outlines that new mineral exploration fairway. So there's a, we think there's a good chance of discovery there at some point and uh, some of the uh, the outcomes of that work we're already seeing because a lot of companies are taking up uh, new tenements in that region to the east of Tenant Creek as well. And at the moment that's something like more than 80,000 square kilometres of new tenements that, uh, that are linked to that work we've done there. The third case study in EFTF is the Kidson Subbasin in Western Australia. So the Kidson Subbasin is part of the Canning Basin. Um, and there we've uh, run a very long seismic line right across the basin. Uh, there was a stratigraphic drill hole which was done in conjunction with the Geological Survey of Western Australia. Um, and that information has really allowed us to revise the basin architecture. Um, and when we know something more about the, the thickness and the distribution of sediments in that basin, we can revisit what our estimates of the gas in place in that basement might, basin might be. And a, a pretty rough uh, conceptual sort of model of that suggests we've got maybe 22% more potential for 22% more gas in that, uh, that basin than we previously thought. Um, we've also looked at a few case studies that were prior to um, exploring for the future. Those three um, previous ones are all uh, published in a report, which, I'll, which you can get from our website. Um, these ones aren't quite published yet, but the results, are, that's all just being wrapped up. Um, the first one here was a project that ran sort of for four years, uh, 2012 and onwards. Uh, to look at a mineral potential mapper, which is taking a whole, together, bringing together a whole lot of uh, constraints from geoscience data and coming up with these mineral potential maps. And the map you can see there is a national map of nickel, copper and platinum group element deposit uh, um, prospectivity um, in, uh, right around Australia. And one of the key outcomes of that that sort of demonstrates its success and the benefits of doing that work is this Julimar discovery in Western Australia. And the next map sort of shows a slightly different colour scale of the mineral potential around the Perth region from that map. And you can see there that there's a new, uh, very, very promising prospect in that region, uh, the Julimar prospect, which you know, they've only drilled a few holes so far, but all of them are finding really good stuff. So impact is looking good. The second case study is a Salt Lake study, which was a, mainly a desktop study um, uh, where GA assessed the uh, resource potential of salt lakes. And uh, the, the map you can see there, the bluish sort of colours are all salt lakes around Australia. I'll zoom into this little area in here. Uh, it's pretty hard to see anything from that map, but basically those green, red, orange colours are salt lakes. And there's a couple of salt lakes there worth flagging. Lake Wells, which has a, you know, a weight percent of potassium in potash of greater than 4.6. So that looks, looks pretty promising for, for potash. And Lake Way, which again has quite high uh, potassium levels in the potash. And these two areas are areas where mines are actually under development. So it's showing that uh, the work that GA did guided companies to those areas to, uh, to explore. The final case study is one where we actually have come to uh, fruition with a, an actual gold mine that started producing last year. So this project was a, a joint project between GA, the GSWA. So the relative attribution is about 50-50 to those two organisations. Um, and we collected a whole range of data, including a, a big long seismic profile. And then this rather squished up to make it fit, you can see a, a seismic profile which shows um, known gold provinces of Leonora and Laverton and the Gruyere region further to the east, which was a new region that came out based on that work. So basically that work showed that there's, you know, that one of the characteristics of the Earth's crust in there is big faults, shear zones, which extend right through the depth of the crust. And we see similar features around Gruyere and that's what led companies to go and explore in this region. So I'm going to touch now on the economic benefits of some of these, this work that GA's done and what's coming out of it. I can't go in detail through all of them, but I'm going to start with this um, Northeastern Yilgarn project, 
where you can see on the map there the big long seismic line which extended from uh, Leonora in Western Australia further east by about 380 kilometers. And I'll just step you through some of those things that John talked about on this impact pathway. So if we're looking at the inputs into that project, there was of course the funds that went in from GA, from the Geological Survey of Western Australia, and also the Mineral, Minerals and Energy Research Institute of Western Australia, as it was called at that time. Um, there was a lot of involvement as well from the PMD CRC. So as part of that project, there was the deep seismic survey. There was a lot of geological mapping to you know, help identify some of those shear zones, comparison to the nearby producing regions in Leonora and Laverton and also 3D modelling. And at the end of the project or during the project as we're going, uh, we release these 3D models of this region, publications, presentations, workshops to industry to really um, uh, get the data out there and the, and the new concepts for understanding and, and mineral potential in these regions. So the outcomes of that, um, obviously in this case, is the Gruyere gold mine was established. Um, there's also ongoing exploration in this region, that which you know is the counterfactual that John mentioned. It probably would would not have happened as soon if it wasn't for this work. Um, and of course, there's potential to find more, many more new uh, mines in this new mineral province. The impacts, the infrastructure investment in a remote region, the net economic benefits to the Australian economy, and I'll talk more about those in, in separately, and then a large number of jobs which are brought into that region as well. The next little part I'll bring up here just shows that, I guess, to you know, in terms of estimating the benefit, the, the, the investment that GA and the partners, mainly GSWA, the Geological Survey of Western Australia put in, roughly 50-50 split. And the key thing we want to demonstrate here is the net benefit for every dollar that GA spent uh, in this region that comes back to the Australian economy or to the Commonwealth Government in terms of uh, corporate taxes. Um, the numbers here are only the GA portion, so of course there's also a benefit that comes from the from the Geological Survey of Western Australia portion. We can see here there's it's quite reasonable multipliers on for every dollar spent we're putting quite a bit of money back into the economy. Um, the next couple of slides will quantify that. I'll show those sort of numbers for the rest of the case studies. Like I said, I can't um, give you the details of all of those in the time we've got. But basically what you can see here is the plot on the left is the net benefit to Australia for every dollar that GA spent on each of those projects. Um, so, you know, the, the left plot there up to around about $500 for every dollar we put in, um, depending on the, um, the assumptions that are made in that modelling, which I'll come to in a moment as well. And on the right is also the return to the Commonwealth, which certainly suggests that by investing in these programs, there's a good chance that the money is going to be made back in an economic sense. So just a couple of sort of uh, points here on these, these plots. The, the net present value is in 2018 dollars um, and the range of values that's reflected there from minimum to maximum reflects a sensitivity analysis that ASL Allen did in their economic modelling. So considering some variations in commodity prices, operating costs, success rates, the size of the discovery we've assumed in that. If we look at that in actual dollar terms, in terms of the net benefit to the, into the input into the economy and the dollars returned to the Commonwealth in terms of those corporate taxes, again, we can see quite, quite significant benefits from these, uh, from these case studies. Um, so you know, perhaps up to as much as a billion dollars depending, uh, depending on the assumptions you make. So I will talk about those assumptions a little bit now because that's quite important. Um, and the, the, the concept that John talked about as well are these, these benefits are a, a lower bound estimate. So to make the estimate, we have to make an assumption that something will be discovered in these areas and that something will eventually become a mine which will then inject the, the, the money into the economy. So these, these benefits are actually based on a single actual or assumed mine or a, a gas project in the case of the Kidson. Um, and it's quite possible, of course, that many of these regions will have more than one discovery. I guess it's also possible that there'll be no discoveries, but um, I wanted to capture that in this table. Uh, you can see here the list on the left of all the different case studies um, in the analysis uh, in the discovery part. So for the three EFTF studies, the Exploring for the Future studies, we have to assume that deposits are found. Uh, so with some kind of discovery has been made uh, in terms of a mineral mineral discovery. Uh, in the, the, the three pre-EFTF uh, case studies, you know, the, we, we have actual discoveries. We know that there's potash mines in the salt lake, potash deposits in the salt lakes, which are being developed to mines. And we know that there's that Julimar discovery. And of course, the Gruyere gold mine is, um, is, is producing. Um, in terms of actually, and actually a mine happening, we have in all of the cases except Gruyere, we've had to make some kind of assumptions on the size of a mine that might be discovered. And you can see here in the, in the key assumption column there, what's, what's the assumptions in the, that economic modeling are. So for the Julimar discovery, for example, in the mineral potential mapper one, 
uh, ASIL Allen modelled the benefits from a, a deposit that might be somewhere between 10 and 50 million tonnes of, of ore. And uh, Lake Wells, the, the potash mine, which is under development, you know, maybe 150,000 tonnes per year. And again, the net benefits are shown in that plot on the right there. And a, a sum of the potential benefits ranges from about 1.4 to about 4.9 billion. If we link that back to GA's, I guess, goals and strategy, um, one of the key pillars of that strategy 2028, which sets out our, sets out our strategic focus is building oh. Australia's resources wealth. And that's about maximizing the benefits of our mineral and energy resources now and into the future. And one of the key, one of the four components of that is that we will stimulate mineral exploration uh, to open up new producing provinces with a mineral endowment worth over $100 billion. And if we take those numbers that were in the previous table, I can quickly flick back. You can see in the bottom right there, 4.9 billion. If we consider that in a mineral sense, um, the actual sum is something like 4.5 billion of potential value. So you could argue that uh, ASIL Allen's modelling um, has suggested a net benefit for mineral resource case studies is about four and a half billion. So if all the assumptions are correct and everything comes to fruition, we're, we're almost 5% on the way to that target already. Okay, the final point I wanted to make here in the analysis that ASIL Allen made is the, um, is the timelines to that impact. And we have one case study where we can really see the timeline from you know, the start of the GA pre-competitive geoscience work to the first gold delivered in the Gruyere gold mine, which is 18 years. It was around about 12 years from the initial work commencing uh, by GA and the GSWA until uh, the discovery drill hole in 2013. Um, so it's 18 years the time it's taken to, uh, to, to realise that benefit and impact. Similarly for the Salt Lake study, um, you know, there's a feasibility study has been released and, and working towards a mine, but it looks like it's going to be probably around a decade from the start of that work till actual production of potash from Lake Wells. And similarly for the Julimar, it's a little bit earlier on in that whole process, but you know, it could still be another five or 10 years. So potentially 15 odd years until, uh, until that, that comes to fruition as well. Um, so I think the key point to make here is we have to realise that you know, if these benefits are coming, the, the full realisation of these benefits from exploring for the future, the program which is uh, ongoing now, could still be up to a decade away. Right now, um, I'm pretty much ready to hand over to Joe to talk about uh, some of the more the, the, the social sort of benefits that come. I'm going to kind of introduce maybe the, the, a little bit the concept of um, the, the case study that he's been looking at. And again, that's this, <coughs> excuse me, new exploration in the East Tenant area. And if we look at the impact pathway from that in terms of inputs, of course, there was all the exploring for the future funds. We had contributions from the geological surveys of Queensland and Northern Territory. Um, there was a whole range of data acquisition in this region um, and this sort of, uh, we were aiming to reduce the mineral exploration search space. Um, we think we've done that successfully in the sense of those mineral potential maps which focus in on the East Tenant region. Um, so there's most mineral pros prospectivity models for that region which are an output which uh, really guide the, um, the industry to you know, the, the, hopefully the, the sweet spot for the exploration. Um, the outcomes of that is all that new exploration tenements. We're seeing that, that very large interest in that region and the impacts down the track. Well, okay, sorry, getting ahead of myself. Uh, another outcome we would add since uh, doing this analysis potentially is that the uh, exploring for the future program was extended because we've been able to demonstrate the benefits and the impacts that are coming out of that work. So the reduced risk to explorers is a benefit. Um, I've talked about the, uh, the net benefits in an economic sense from you know, assuming some kind of size mine in that region. But the other factor, of course, is the regional jobs uh, that come into the communities around there. And that's really the topic that uh, Joe is going to focus on. Um, so I'm going to end my screen sharing and hand over to Joe to, um, to continue. Yep. OK. So. Yeah, so um, Keith and I signed up for uh, REMPLAN um, economic software package and it, um, it gave us a way to sort of um, complement the existing uh, research that had been done on the benefits and it, it allowed us to run some scenarios so we could see the broader impact on the economy and um, the sort of jobs that we could expect to be created. Um, so the first thing we wanted to look at were those exploration activities because um, when you add them all up, they're actually a, a fairly sizable impact on the economy just, um, just by themselves. So um, I'll explain a bit about how the software works, but essentially what we, what we know for sure is that at least 75 million is going to be spent 
uh, on these exploration projects over the next um, four or five years. Uh, and that includes the 65 million announced by Santos. Um, for the Queensland tenements, we looked at the minimum spending requirements per sub block and the Northern Territory actually gave us aggregate estimates, um, which were quite uh, below what we were expecting, but that was um, uh, a little bit to do with Corona delaying things, but it was mostly because they're greenfield exploration and the, the companies typically um, only spend small amounts at the start. And once they start to see some good results, then they start to commit uh, more more spending. So, so definitely 100 million or more is a, is on the cards. Um, so this slide's actually showing the results, but I also want to speak about how the modelling works. Um, so what you can see here is the jobs that will be generated from those exploration activities, and the red dots they um, correspond to the right hand side axes and that shows you the income tax that will be generated. So, so what we've done is um, to model the scenario, uh, we basically lump all the exploration companies into these uh, sort of bucket years. So you can think of year one as a sort of a desktop study or an airborne survey or something like that. Year two and three is where they start to do some initial surveying and field work and and year four and five is where they start to ramp up the drilling. Um, year five looks small on this chart because it's only capturing some of those Queensland projects and the bulk of the spending is of course Santos who announced they were going to do it in, in four years. So, so when we plug in that 75 million, we, we plug in where it's going to be spent and uh, that comes up as the direct effect. And so that's the sort of jobs that will be generated from the exploration. And those explorers, they go out and they also, they need food and accommodation and they need equipment and supplies. And so all the other industries in the area, they, they support, supply those things. And all together, those, all those people are employed, they're all earning an income and they go out and they spend their money in the economy. So the REMPLAN software allows us to capture all those effects and basically um, lets us know how many jobs will be generated. And from that, we can look at ATO data and, um, sorry, the ABS data and the ATO uh, simple tax calculator to get an estimate of total income tax. So you can see 18 million, that's um, no small amount. We really um, sort of points to the fact that, well, we actually, are not that far away from starting to see the benefits of the Exploring for the Future program actually start to trickle in. Um, you can't really match year one with 2020, but uh, given that the bulk of it is Santos, you kind of think that they, they probably are in that year one at the moment. Um, and then we can see the total impact on the economy is over 133 million over those five years. So um, pretty significant. Uh, the next thing we wanted to look at was, um, yeah, the, the event that they actually do find a, a deposit and they do develop it. So we wanted to sort of have a, uh, have a look at what that might look like. And to do that, we, um, we obviously try to match things up with ACL Allen um, to see what a Ernest Henry size development would look like, a Mount Isa size. Uh, and we also had a look at the OCE's major project starter and basically the average size gold or copper or base metal development over the last four or five years has been has averaged about 200 ongoing staff. So I think, um, you know, obviously we can't say what's going to be found, but if they do develop a mine, it's probably more likely to look like that, um, that middle scenario. But at the lower end, we looked at a mine with about 100 ongoing staff um, and operating for about a 10 year period. Uh, and, and for all these scenarios, we also have a, um, a two year construction phase included at the start. But this lower end scenario, I think that's giving out some really um, positive results because you can see there the total increase to the economy is 885 million, which is huge. And um, we're talking about a, a pretty small uh, mine compared to what you see in Australia. And you can also, if you add the company tax, income tax and royalties on that low end scenario, well, you've got over 100 million coming back to government. 
Um, but like I said, we're more likely to expect something around the 200 or 500 mark. And if they do find the next Mount Isa, that's that's definitely going to have a, a really remarkable impact on the economy. Uh, but obviously, that's a pretty rare event. Uh, we did a very similar thing for gas. Um, so we wanted to sort of see what a um, unconventional onshore gas play in Northern Australia would look like. And we based it on uh, drill campaigns of 100 wells up to 400 wells. Um, we were liaising with AME to figure out um, what sort of staff would be required to develop something that's similar to uh, Buru Energy in the canning, but also the Permium Shale um, as an analogue over in America. Uh, so we basically thought that it would take, you know, there'd be a development phase of five years and then the bulk of the gas would be extracted over a further five year of operation. And yep, yeah, well, I won't speak too much about the results, but you can see there the total output for the low end scenario, that's um, yeah, that's over 400 million coming back to the economy. And then just finally, we've also started looking at the the impact of exploring for the future on um, on new irrigated farmland. And I think it's really exciting because a lot of these projects are a lot closer down the track. In fact, some of them are already in the pipeline. And you can see on the slides, um, this scenario is sort of modelling the uh, Fortune Agribusiness, um, who announced they were looking to develop um, three and a half thousand hectares of new irrigated land. Uh, so we've made some assumptions about that being, uh, it's possibly going to cost about $35 million to set that up and then about $14 million um, ongoing to have it operating. Um, and again, it, there's uh, close to 100 jobs there in the initial phase and 77 jobs going um, over a 20 year period, you know, he's like a fairly remote and um, regional economy that's quite big. And you can see there the total output of 132 million, which is, is um, you know, more than what we invested in phase one of EFTF. Uh, so that's it for me. I'll um, hand back to, I think Rani is up next. So let me begin by outlining two key policy objectives that underpin Digital Earth Australia. The first is the free and open satellite data that will improve the efficiency and effectiveness of the Australian government's investments and improve how we manage our natural resources. Secondly, that Australian businesses will capitalise on the satellite data, which in turn supports innovation and growth in the digital economy and drives increased productivity across a wide range of sectors. So how does DEA support industry and what exactly is it? DEA translates libraries of free satellite imagery into evidence of how Australia's land and water bodies change over time. So the information that's provided through DEA to government, industry and individuals is openly accessible, routine, robust and of high quality and in unprecedented detail. DEA focuses the user's time and effort on creating value out of the data rather than finding ways to manage it, to clean it up or to present it. Next slide, please. So DEA realises its value proposition when there is evidence to show that the program's policy objectives have been met, when the benefits outweigh the cost of providing the service, and when future evaluations confirm the program contributes to securing both state and federal government investment in monitoring and protecting the health of our land and oceans. Next slide, please. The underlying premise of the evaluation framework is to provide credible, credible evidence of the effects of our research and innovation activities on the economy, the environment and society. By adopting the methodology explained earlier in the presentation, the social, environmental and financial impacts of a program such as DEA can be forecast and articulated to provide a broad perspective of a program's value. Next slide, please. 
DEA's evaluation framework will seek to document the inputs and activities and establish what outputs, outcomes and impact the project is anticipated to deliver over the next three to 10 years. This slide sh shows a very simplified version of the impact DEA is forecast to have on the agricultural sector. And if you are interested in a more of a deep dive into that, in terms of case study narratives, please visit DEA's YouTube channel to see a recording of our August public showcase. So how will DEA measure its outcomes? It will measure its outcomes through showing the value of public research data and the infrastructure required by agencies to develop a framework for impact evaluation. But planning for impact will use a triple bottom line classification approach and that there's consideration of more than a fiscal return on investment. That non-monetary impacts require a multi-source evidence base with both qualitative, quantitative data. Next slide, please. We should be looking at the GA strategy. And um, very importantly, with this methodology, the impact pathway um, shows how DEA's impact aligns with Geoscience Australia's strategic priority to enable an informed Australia. So you'll see that in the bottom right hand corner of the, um, the six impact areas. Enabling an informed Australia is aims to build a trusted data, trusted data and platforms and expertise to support high impact geoscience. And undoubtedly, DEA's impact can also be aligned with a number of other strategic priorities identified here. So since 2018, DEA has received ongoing funding from the Australian government, making it a flagship program for Geoscience Australia along with positioning Australia and exploring for the future. Next slide, please. So how will we know that DEA has made impact? Where will we find evidence? We'll see an uptake in usage and adoption of DEA's analysis ready data. We will see new products and services driven by the needs of users. We'll see increased efficiency in the delivery of government programs and regulation, and we'll see applications and derivatives developed for commercial use by industry. We'll also see a global exemplar, which demonstrates the merits of openly sharing data across platforms. Next and final slide, please. So recent economic modelling has shown that to harness the future benefits of earth and marine observation, Australia needs to continue to build this capability. DEA forms part of a capability which is forecast to deliver around $96 billion back to the Australian economy by 2030. Evidence of impact is the business case required to ensure that this investment is for the future of all Australians and the future of our planet. Thank you very much. And um, I'll hand back to Keith. Thank you, Rani, and um, well done <laughs> managing all of that. Yes, it's it's awesome that you know, we've got this wonderful technology. It doesn't always quite go to plan, but I think we're, we're very used to that now in this brave new world. So thank you, Rani. Um, so we've got a, a few minutes uh, time for um, some quick uh, questions here. So um, I've just got uh, a couple of questions. I think I'll, I'll pass to John, actually. So um, one of them was about... Um, how do you assess the validity of predicted ROI and uh, are there fixed timelines? Um, over to you, John. Thank, thanks, Keith. Um, I guess it varies from, from, from um, case to case. I mean, we, we, when we make our assumptions, we're, we're conservative, but we also take into account what the, you know, the industry, the users, the, um, the, the people who are actually um, 
utilizing uh, outputs and, and, out, and generating outcomes, what they're telling us. So we, we try to be as well informed as possible. So there's, there's, but there's no fixed sort of number. It will just depend on what we, what we, what we, what we, what we think will be the case. And, and we try to be as well informed as possible because when you're building that narrative, it's always important to sort of not open any doors for people to say, oh, no, well, that's not right, you know, or, or, or no, this, that's wrong, we should be doing something completely different or the timeline is wrong. People can still argue that, but it, we're always, it's important to be always be transparent about why we've selected a particular number so that they can see why that, that choice has been made and, you know, We'll often have discussions with with uh, with our clients about about that, and and um, and if they if they usually they are convinced that that the approach we've chosen is probably a sensible one. Thanks, Keith. Thank you, John. Uh, one more question, I guess, related uh, to that as well as that, um, and I, I think I know the answer to this, but I'll, I'll pass it to you, to you as John as well, is that presumably the net benefit includes royalties. So, you know, the, the, in this case, the, you know, the, the royalties that would go back to the state and territory jurisdictions. Over to you. Yeah. Thanks, Keith. Yes. I mean, we take, we, um, we take all the sort of benefits into account. We have to be careful not to sort of double count, think, but double count anything. So that's that's uh, again one of those examples where it's important to make sure that you don't open uh, open the door to people um, criticizing your approach or, or finding fault with it. So um, yeah, we try to take account of all those benefits. We don't take account of every benefit because some of them in, are. Kind of transfers between different parts of the economy, and we don't, we won't necessarily count those always. Sorry, and I should say that that um, I'm a scientist myself, and um, uh, I usually get one of the economists on my team to to do the CBAs, um, and I then question them and say, why is it this and why is it that, um, and uh, it, that helps because, um, as a non non economist, uh, if I, if I can't understand what they're telling me, then the risk that the, the good chance that others won't understand it as well. And then, I guess, you know, if I can make another point about that narrative and how important it is to get that right, because what we what we're trying to do with with case studies is basically sell you know the science that's being done to to the reader um, sometimes researchers get very nervous oh you're going to you know analyze my research and you know um, it's going to be a bad outcome for me no it's, it's always about trying to show what great research is being done and actually uh, assess what the benefits could be from that and sometimes we're assessing actual benefits uh, and sometimes we're having to make assumptions, assumptions that are informed by conversation with with users of the of the research outputs. So back to you, Keith. Thank you, John. Um, I think we'll we'll wrap it up there. So thank you, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you to all the speakers. And um, as a quick wrap up, I think I hope this has uh, shown um, that you know what's. Uh, what we're working on at Geoscience Australia, and as I said at the beginning about how we communicate not just the science, but the impact and the uh, the relevance it has for people's lives is the, the work we do. So with that, I'll um, hand back to Marina to wrap, wrap up today's session. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks everybody for attending and thanks to the speakers for an awesome seminar. Two last items, on Friday this week at 12 noon, we have a special seminar by Jessica Stromberg from CSRO sniffs of an ancient sediment hosted copper system in the world's oldest lake, revealing the results of a new study on the complex 2.7 uh, Tumbiamba formation in the Pilbara Craton. This talk will also celebrate, we're at Purple Day and I've put the, the words in the, the chat, uh, and next week our regular 
Wednesday seminar continues with a talk by David Hasselhurst, the new Deputy, Deputy Secretary, Agricultural Trade Group in the Department of Agriculture, which is really important, water and the environment. He'll be presenting and how an agile mindset benefits the workplace. Uh, again, thank you everybody for joining us and see you next week, maybe Friday even. Makes me wish I was at GA. Bye everybody. Thank you.